Good morning, family. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Are you experiencing some form of drought in one or more areas of your life? You've come to the right place. Today, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to pour out an overflow of His living waters onto the parched ground of our lives. And we hope you're ready to experience the abundance that God's intended for you. Let's be expectant for the open floodgates of heaven and welcome our God, who is the living water. Come, Holy Spirit, and move among us. 
Testimonies of God's love in this room. There are stories in people's hearts of His love and what God did for them, what God did for you. Wow. And if you want a testimony of this love and a story of this love that you can remember ages and ages to come. Oh, 
Yes, thank you, Lord, that you love us so much with such abandon and so graciously and kindly and with such an amazing sense of just recklessness even, Lord. We thank you for that love. And it's because of that love it's easy for us to worship you, to lift up your name, and to declare that you are worthy of it all. And we pray today, Lord, as we continue with this service, as we worship you through the word, that your name will be glorified and that your name will be lifted up. We love you, Lord. And thank you for your presence with us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to give you opportunity right now to pay your tithes and give your offering as we respond to the Lord because we love Him and we worship Him and also because as the Word instructs us. So won't you follow the prompts on the screen right now and get ready to give to the Lord and give cheerfully and gladly. Uh, and thank you for your generosity in giving. Well, I want to say to the East family, we have wonderful news for you that as of next week, we are going to be online and on site and our on site services will be streamed live online for you to participate in. So you are welcome to join us on site on a Sunday morning as within the restrictions that is allowed and then also to view that service online. To accommodate that and make that possible, we're going to move the service to 10 o'clock and both services, the on-site and the online services will start at 10 o'clock and you are welcome to join us. The watch parties have been working so well. So for those of you that are meeting together in uh, community groups or small groups, friendship groups, uh, to watch the service with others, won't you continue to do that? You're more than welcome to join us 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and to watch the live streaming of the service with all the live elements from the Sunday on-site experience. Um, with the radio, they're going to remain on uh, at 9.30 because that's our time slot that we have on the radio. So the radio service will, will continue to be broadcast at 9.30, but for the on-site service and the online service, you are welcome to join us at 10 o'clock. So from next week on, services on-site at 10 o'clock, or online at your, in your home or in a watch party, please join us for that. If you have, want to know any more information, then uh, please go to hatfield.co.za, our website, and uh, anything that you may need to know, you will find on there. But we look forward to being with you and connecting with you and trust the Lord for great times together. Amen. So we're busy with our series called Overflow that we started a couple of weeks ago. And the reason for this series, it was really born out of seeing that in Scripture so often water is used by God and uh, the prophets and by Jesus in the New Testament and others to describe our relationship and elements of our relationship with God um, and particularly in how the Israelites would receive water and how they would uh, have to get water. Now, please remember that uh, in that part of the world, in Israel, it's an arid area, and so water is not in abundance, but it was very important. Obviously, for all of life to exist, we need water. We can't survive very long without water, uh, not only as human, but livestock and our, our crops, everything need water. And in that time, in particularly the Old Testament, this analogy of water is used to describe the dependency of God's people on Him and how He is the one that sustains them. Uh, and to use this picture, for instance, uh, Jeremiah, and I'm going to read a couple of verses from Jeremiah, as a prophet to the Israelites, used this analogy to describe to them the state they were in and how they were not making use of who God is and connected to Him in the right way and drawing from Him the living waters. And the analogy he uses for us, for it to make sense for us, we have to remember that in the times of the Israelites, there were three ways that they got water. And uh, these three ways, I'm going to list them for you now, uh, as in, in order from which was the best, the, the way that they got water, to the way that was the least uh, efficient and, uh, and sort of the way that they, that they could get water sometimes, but it wasn't a very trustworthy way to get water. So the first way that the Israelites got water in that time, uh, in biblical times, was from what is the scripture refers to as living waters. Now, living waters is nothing other than rivers or artesian wells, flowing water, water that springs up and that flow. So like a river, um, and on screen you'll see a picture of the Jordan River in the summertime when it's raining, and
and you can see the, this river in, in full flow. And um, that would be living waters that is so often described in the scripture. Uh, and that was the best way to have water in that time and have access to water that would sustain livelihoods, crops, livestock, everything that would be able to flourish because there was a river of flowing, fresh, moving water. Then second to that, if you didn't have a river, then the next thing you could do is dig a well. And uh, a well was dug, and when they discovered that there were underground water, they could tap into that reservoir of water. And uh, as we know, what they did with wells is they would dig deep into the soil and, until they find water, and then they would line that hole with you know, some form of rocks or something that they would build, uh, and then they would be able to, to drop dump something like a bucket or a, wine, a skin of an animal that they shaped, and they would be able to draw water out from the, under the ground. And that water would then be used for homes, for livestock, for crops. And in those days, if you had a well on your land, you were, you were in a good place. It was almost more important than having land was having a well. Because you could have land in a dry area like that. It didn't take you very far, but you needed water. So wells were very important. And you can read so often about things that happened at wells and important events that happened at wells. So, so the second best way to get water was a well. Then the third best way to get water was called a cistern. And what a cistern was is when, they, when people dug in the limestone and they carved out in the rock hollows and holes, some of them quite, quite big, and they would dig out these holes, and these would become like places where they would catch runoff water or rainwater and be able to store water to feed themselves, to give to themselves or, or for animals or, again, for crop. And these, so what they would do is dig in the, in the limestone, and then they would, they would sort of you know, seal it with some form of, 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 of like a cement that they had almost, um, and they would seal it and then be able to store water in that. But you can understand why a river is so much better to have because that's a constant flowing source of fresh water, while a cistern uh, is dependent on whether there's rainfall or, or some other flow of water that happens so that the water can be stored in there. The cistern in and of itself cannot produce water like a river can or even like you can get from a well for a long period of time. It was dependent on the rain mostly and then they would be able to store water in that. So these were the three main ways that people in that time gathered water or had access to water. And uh, the prophet uses this to describe something of what the Israelites were doing in their relationship with God and how they were treating God and um, what they were doing with their love and allegiance. And uh, to get to that, I want to first of all go to a, a scripture that uh, is in Jeremiah 17 verse 13, where Jeremiah describes for us living water and he links it to God and who God is. So let's read let Jeremiah 17 verse 13. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. So here in the, in the scriptures and in other places also, the, 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 the Bible likens God to this living water, this river that continuously flows and gives life. And it says, God is our primary, our best source of life is when we are with God. And, and here the, the prophet says to Israel, um, if you turn away from this river of life, if you move away from the river, you're going to move into the dusty, dry places where there are, is no water, and you're going to cause yourself great difficulty, and ultimately you will find it really hard to sustain your life and to be in life uh, because you have forsaken the spring of living water. So literally the picture is painting for us. Is, is here's a river, strong, flowing, beautiful, fresh water river with things that grow on its banks. There's, it's very easy to have access to this water. If you planted crops next to the river, it would be easy to dig a canal and then your, your fields will be irrigated. Your animals could drink from the river. You could draw from the river for your own household needs, and it's very easy. But for some reason, people would decide that they want to move away from this river and they would love to rather go live somewhere else. And so they move away from the river. And the further they move away from the river, obviously the further away they're from a water source. And so they move into this dry, arid area. And when they come into this dry, arid area, they now need water. And they need to sustain themselves. And 
he is saying to them, he's using this analogy with Israel to say, if you turn away from God, that's what you're doing. You're turning away from the living waters and you're going to something that is far inferior and that will not sustain you. Um, and this is the problem that God had with the Israelites at the time. Remember, Jeremiah is writing in the time of the exile, the time of the great rebellion of Israel. And uh, he explains and he uses this analogy to explain to them what they're busy doing. And in Jeremiah 2 verse 13, we see this a little bit deeper explained, even more, and applied to them particularly as Israel, where he says in verse 13 of Jeremiah 2, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me. That's the number one sin. They have forsaken me. They've turned from this river of life. They've moved away from the river of life. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So God says the Israelites have sinned against him in that they have turned away from him as their, as their source of living water, and they have now moved to a space where they are living off man-made cisterns, and they are living off this, these cisterns, these holes that they dug and, and hewed out in the rock that are not able to care for them and sustain them. And God says, you have done this, and this is your sin. Now, the application in the time particularly was God saying that these cisterns that they are now using um, to sustain themselves is, are, are like idols. Uh, and, and he uses this because he's, he's saying to them, like a cistern is a man-made water receptacle. It's, a, it's something that a man digs out. So an idol is something that a man makes. Idols are carved out of wood, as I said elsewhere in the scripture, or, 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 or made from metal, but made by human hands and human imagination. And he says, turning to idols is like coming to a man-made cistern and to try and live of that instead of turning to God, who the creator, the one who made all of life and sustains life, who is this river of life that is constantly flowing and has everything you need. And he says, this is what people are doing. They're turning away from the source of life that has more than enough for them. And they're turning to the scarcity, this lack, this, this, this thing that would fail. Because the problem with cisterns was, exactly as it says in the scripture, is that they, they can break. A cistern cracks over time. Because it's man-made, it cannot last. It cannot go forever. Um, and, and they often had to you know, dig a cistern and use it for a period of time and then move on and have to dig another. That's why you often find in the scripture, for instance, people thrown in cisterns like Joseph and others. That And Jeremiah himself was thrown into a cistern. When, when these cisterns were no longer used, they would often become like temporary prisons or, or hiding places in a wartime or something because they were temporary in their, in their very makeup and nature because they're man-made. They cannot do for you what the river can. Now, why is it that God's people would do this? Just, just imagine with me, you're living next to a river. It's lush, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. But then for some other reason you say, no, I'm going to be better off to go and live in the desert in the dry places. And I'll be okay because I may not have the river, but I can, I can, I can provide water for myself if I just dig cisterns. That, that'll catch the rain. Why would you do that? Why would the Israelites do that? That's the analogy here that he's using. And the, the, the reason for that is given to us in the scripture, in the way Jeremiah words this indictment against the Israelites. He says, They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. You see, that's the thing, is the reason why we move away from God to, to places that are not nearly as good as it is as being with God, is because we believe the lie that if it is our own, it is better for us. The, the greatest lie, one of the greatest lies that mankind has ever believed and that the enemy got us to, to buy into is this lie, that for us to have the best kind of life, we have to be free. And freedom means having what I want and being able to choose everything that I want. We believe that freedom is not possible if I cannot have autonomous uh, uh, complete absolute autonomy and make the choices that I want to make. We believe that freedom comes about when I can choose what I want. Where I'm not able to choose, there I am not free. And so we pursue freedom. And we literally say that rather than have 
this free-flowing, life-giving river. But it is not my river, it's God. I, and to stay by the river, I'm confined to the river. I'm, in a sense, controlled by the river. I have to submit to the river. I have to live off the river. I'm, I'm dependent on the river. We say, oh, no, I want to be independent. I want to do my own thing. And therefore, I'm better off to go into the desert and the dry places and, and, and carve out my own water supply and, and, and make my own water supply because then I'm not dependent on the river. Then I'm not controlled by the river. Then I can do what I want to do and have my own way. And that's literally what we say. Rather than have you, God, I'm going to go and have my own and do my own thing. Now, <laughs> what we forget when we do this, for instance, just to use this example, is that you can dig your own cistern, but you can't make your own water. That yes, you have the freedom of choice, the God-given freedom of choice. God gave you that choice, that, that free will to choose that you don't want to live with him, that you don't want to live off his abundance, that you don't want to live by the river. He gave you that choice. And you can exercise that choice and go and carve your own cisterns out and say, I'm going to live apart from God. I'm not going to be with God. Much like we spoke last week in our, in our talking about the Adam and Eve and within the, the Garden of Eden and Paradise, you know, when, when, when Satan came and tempted them and said, did God really say? He caused them to believe that if they could decide for themselves what right and wrong is, they would be better off because then they're free. Then they're free to do what they want. And, and that's the thing. We go and we carve out for ourselves these cisterns and we say, well, this is going to be what's going to provide for me. This philosophy or this way of thinking or, or this understanding, this is going to make my life better because it's mine. It's my own. <laughs> but the, the, the irony of it is unless God causes the rain to fall and so that the cistern can actually gain water, the cistern in and of itself cannot hold water. So even if you're living off the cistern in the desert, you're still dependent on God. You're still having to you know, recognize that he's the provider and the giver of life. And that's the grace of God. That even though you've decided that I don't want to live by the river, I don't want to be dependent on God, and now go live on your own in the desert, carve your own cistern out, God still, by his grace, pours rain out upon us and cause rain to fall and to, so that the cistern can actually hold rain. Because we cannot make rain. We cannot make water. We can catch water, but we can't make it. And that's what we forget. We have a free will and we can choose whatever we want, but that doesn't mean we are free from the consequences of our choices. If you choose to live by God and by his supply of life-giving water, there's benefits that you get with that and the reality that that shapes in your life and in your world. If you choose to live apart from God and to carve out your own cistern and to, to, to look for your own provision and make, make life for yourself without God, then that has consequences and that'll shape your reality and that'll shape what your life will look like. And, and that's just what it is. So we go off and we go and make our own cisterns, thinking that we'll be better off. And, and because we believe this lie that freedom means having to have what you want in life, and that it is you're only free if you can choose whatever you want and have that in life. To illustrate this point and how, how, how far we take this way of thinking and how this seems to be even going to more, can I say, even bizarre realities in our world right now, I want to remind you of a story, and I think I've, I've mentioned it once before, of a young man, Raphael Samuel who uh, lives in India, uh, I think at the time he was 27 years old, and this happened in 2019, that took his parents to court, and he, court, and he sued his parents because he, uh, he, be he said that they infringed on his rights of choice by, by procreating him without his permission. That he was born, and he didn't choose to be born, but by their choice they gave life to him, and he now says that they therefore owe him maintenance and to pay him to be alive because he's not alive by his own choice he's alive by their choice and therefore he took him to court to get the court to instruct his parents that they have to now look after him and pay for him to live because he's alive not by his own choice but by their choice you see and that's what we think freedom means that i'm only free if my life is exactly what i choose it to be if anybody else makes a choice and that choice shapes me, that infringes on my freedom, and therefore I am not free. 
The only way I can be free is to, is to live the life I want to live by the choices I make. And in that sense, to create myself in my own image and to be what I want to be, not because of anybody else or anything else. Um, he says the following, this young man, Raphael Samuel, um, in, in, a, in a post, he said this, I want everyone in India and the world to realize one thing, that they are born without their consent. I want them to understand that they do not owe their parents anything. He said, if we are born without our consent, we should be maintained for our life. We should be paid by our parents to live. To children, I would like to say, do not do anything for your parents. If you do not want to, if you want to, if you truly, genuinely feel like doing it, do it, he added. You see, he says, you don't owe your parents anything because they made a choice and ultimately they gave life to you because they wanted something. That doesn't mean you are now obliged to them because they gave you life. If you want to do something nice for your parents, do it, but don't do it because you have, you know, because they made you and they are your parents. You don't owe them anything. They made their choice. You've got to be free to live your choice. And uh, this, this is a growing trend in our world, particularly in parts like India, um, where people are, have a very nihilistic view of life, where they believe life has no good to it. And how dare you bring children into a world that struggles so much? And it's actually called antinatalism, uh, this movement. And where people are saying, you should have, you know, I, you didn't give my permission to give birth to me. Now, when you listen to that, you go, wow. There's a, there's a sense of disconnect to reality to that, isn't it? it? It sounds bizarre. But you can follow the thinking. Because if the thinking is true, that I'm only free because I choose, then and, and, and if, if only what I have in my life is what I choose, then only am I free, then you can follow that way of thinking. But you see, that's the lie. And this may be an extreme case of that how that lie is drawn to its conclusion. But that's what we do all day long as human beings. We are consistently trying to find how we can carve out our own cisterns, how we can live life autonomous, independent from God. And we don't like it if God in any way encroaches on us by, by making something in our lives, determining something. We want to be people that are completely, um, you know, self-determined in a way that only in my life is real, is what I choose. So therefore, for instance, nowadays, we, we, we don't like the fact that God determined my sex. That when I get born, I get born XX or XY with the chromosomes that determines what my sex is. I, how dare God do that? How dare He impose that on me? How dare He say that about me and determine that? That takes away my freedom of choice. I want to choose what I am. And so therefore now we live in a world where you choose what your sex is. It cannot be determined for you by God. And we choose that our, uh, our sex is what we feel it should be. And it's this emancipation from God. It's this, this rebellion, dare I say, against him that is continuously displayed in so many different ways. Um, even you know, when we say, I want my truth in life. It's you can have your truth and I will have my truth. It's truth is truth because I believe it to be true. I'm the great judge of what is truth. And, and, uh, and if I believe something to be right, then it's right. If you believe something to be right, that's right. But it's your right. It's not my right. You cannot expect that of me. That's your right and I have my right. And I have my truth and you have, you have your, tru your truth. And we believe that because we say, you know, I cannot be... Uh, you know, beholden to anything else. I cannot let anything else tell me. And I'm, I'm not a good human being. I'm, I'm actually, you know, not a, not a faithful version of myself if I believe something from somebody else and, and follow that. No, I have to choose what I believe and choose what I do and make myself, like I said, in my own image and, and craft myself and create myself and, 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 you know, bring myself to bear in this world. Because that's my responsibility, to be me and the, the version of me that I want to be. With, and God is not going to tell me what that is and interfere in me in any way. I want to tell you that's what the Bible defines as pride. It's that sense of, I can do better on my own than what God can do for me. I will be free when I choose what I want in life. But that's the lie. The scripture is so clear. 
in this analogy that it tells us that God created us, a loving God, not a God that created us for servitude and to abuse us, but a God that made us as a father makes as children. He made us to love us, to have relationship with us, to bestow upon us every good thing that he had. He made a beautiful world for us to live in. He made us and he provided for us everything we need. But for us to, to live and to flourish, we have to live with him, in relationship with him. And that's that picture of the living waters. Live by the river. Live in the river of who God is. But we say, no, no, no. I'm going to make my own cistern. And we go out into the desert and we carve out our cisterns. You know, and we make beautiful cisterns, don't we? We, 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 we sort of layer our cisterns with gold. And, and we mosaic around them such beautiful patterns. You know, Natasha loves to mosaic things and... You know, make things beautiful, and that's what we do. We, we make our cistern, and we make it beautiful, and we, we, we even put like a little building around it, perhaps, or a big building and shade, and, and we make it so comfortable and so beautiful because we believe we can do at least what God can do, and if not, better. It's the story of the, ba of the Tower of Babel. We can do it. We can, if we just work together, if we, if we just exercise our will correctly, and if we, if we just, you know, enforce our will and, and make things the way it should be and do, uh, do our choice and live our truth, then, then we'll make these beautiful cisterns and we don't need God. And, and we can have this beautiful, wonderful life. But what Jeremiah tells us is those cisterns are cracked. They can never compete with what God can give us. They will never last. They will never sustain. And that's the reality of cisterns because cisterns are man-made. Not only do they crack and break, but remember they stagnant in pools of water. There's no flow of water there. There's no inflow of life because it's, disc it's autonomous. It's, it's free. So it becomes this pool of water that, that is just lying there. And you know what happens to water that lies still. It, it becomes a place where all kinds of bacteria and, 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 and organisms begin to grow in. And, and finally it becomes contaminated Perhaps other things fall into it and, and it becomes that which was given to give us life eventually becomes that which kills us. And that's what we do. You see, our, our, our choice, our freedom of choice is important. And it is a very important part of being free is your freedom of choice. Your freedom is connected to your freedom of choice. But the truth from Scripture is that your freedom is only possible if you use your freedom of choice to freely choose to be a child of God and to be uh, in, uh, under the lordship and the kingship of God. But we take that freedom of choice that was given to us by God and we create our own life. And that which God gave us for life and for, for love and for all good things eventually becomes the very thing that destroys us, makes us sick and kills us. Because it is what it is. Because if we don't give it to God, the only other thing we can give it to is we give it to ourselves and we give it to that which is fallible, that which will crack over time, that which will run dry, that which will become contaminated. And our will, that, was, that is this chief instrument in our lives to, to, to use, to glorify God and to tap into everything that is beautiful and to live these amazing lives becomes the very thing that destroys us and harms us and limits us and kills us. And that's the truth of this picture of Scripture. And so this is the story of mankind. We were created, like I said last week, we were created for, for paradise. We were created to live in God's abundance. Another picture of that is we were created to live in the river of God, in the flow of life that is available in Him. But we chose to move away from Him. And so it, our history of mankind is this journey away from God into the desert, into the dry places making for ourselves cisterns to provide for ourselves along the way. And it's also the story of every human being. You and I were made to live with God and to live in the river of God. But we were born in sin. Our hearts have, was born in rebellion against God. So we've walked this journey away from God. 
And as we grow in our lives, we dig more and more cisterns. And we try and find more and more ways where I can look after myself and provide for myself and don't need God. And where I can make my life better. And I can, I can you know, use God even if I need to because it, it serves my purposes. And I think I'm going to create a life for me that will be wonderful and that will be better than even what God can do. Because I've got the answers. I have the truth. I know what is right and wrong. I know how to do it. And as we journey, we just get deeper and deeper into trouble. More and more we begin to see how... These cisterns that we dig off, so such a poor, you know, such a replacement for what God has for us. They no real viable alternative. But we discover this. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came and walked among us to remind us that God is the river of life. And to die for us so that we have a way back to the river of life. And Jesus died on the cross and through the forgiveness and the washing of the blood, we can return, turn back from our wicked ways, turn back from this journey that we are on away from God and come back to God and come back to his provision for us. But it's, it's again, it's our choice. It's our freedom of choice. If you choose to keep going, God will not stop you. But if you choose to turn, then God will take you back to the river of life. And, and what actually happens, the moment I give my heart to Jesus and I get born again, I'm brought back into the river of life. That river of life, because in that sense, it's not something outside of me. And I'll show you the scripture now. It's something inside of me. That river of life, that life of God flows again through me. And because I'm in the river and the river's in me. And God restores me and does a new work in my life. But I have to choose that. And when I choose that... Jesus tells us what, what that means for us. In John 4 verse 14, he met with that woman at the well. Remember, and he had this amazing discussion with her. In verse 14, he says, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus says, man... You can go into the desert, but you'll keep thirsting. You'll keep looking. You'll keep digging another cistern. You'll keep moving from cistern to cistern to try and find what will satisfy you. It's like people, you know, they, they're moving from substance to substance or relationship to relationship or money to money or whatever to try and keep finding that which will make them happy. The last relationship didn't work, but perhaps the next one will. Or, the, you know, the, the last paycheck that I got didn't quite do it, but perhaps if I start the next business or the new thing or if I just need more money, it'll do it or, or whatever it is, you know, and, and we think we're going to get there, but it's just, we just keep getting thirsty. But Jesus says, come to me and you'll never thirst again because you'll have free access to this river of living water. And that river of living water will not just be in you now, but it'll well up within you for eternal life. You, you're going back into the eternal stream of this living water. Revelations 22 verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. This is free. Jesus says, just believe in me and you can have this freely. But you have to choose it. You have to say no to wanting to dig your own cisterns. And you have to come back to the, to the waters of life. And when we come back to the waters of life, there's life in the river. And I want to quickly, just as I draw this to message to an end, mention to you three things that we find in the river. That restores us and, 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 and brings us back into God's original plan for us. You see, because as we've walked away from God and walked into the desert, more and more the cisterns, as they break down, we break down. And the more we drink this, 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 this poor water, this, this contaminated water, the more it breaks down God's desires within us and His plans for us and what He created for us. And the more we become sick and the more we become just get in trouble. But when we come back and we drink of the living water, the blood of Christ cleanses us and this living water is now within us and we're in the water of life. It begins to restore within us that which God intended for us. So there's three things that we find in the, in the river, that life in the river brings us. First of all, there's healing in the river. In Revelation 22 verse 2, one on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are there for the healing of the nations. Our world is being torn apart by man's desires and man's striving 
for their own cisterns. But when we return to God and the river of life, there's healing that comes. God restores and brings healings to the nations. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We are to go into the nations and bring healing to the nations. But that begins with each of us. We receive healing. And I want to ask you today, do you need healing in your body? Do you carry the, the marks of this failing of, of living off a world of the systems of this world in your own body? Do you need healing? Perhaps you need healing in relationships. You need healing in, in your emotional well-being. God is the healer. Come back. I invite you. Come live in the river. Come to the river. Come drink this life-giving water. And I want to pray for you today if you need healing. Secondly, there's joy in the river. In Psalm 46 verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of the Lord, the holy place where the Most High dwells. There is a river whose streams make glad. When you're living in the river of God, there's a joy that comes up in your life. When you live off the cisterns, it's understandable that depression sets in, that anxiety sets in, that we start feeling alone and lonely, that we see the failing because we, we're relying on something that cannot sustain us. And it will produce in us anxiety because we see the water getting old. We see the water running out. We feel, okay, now I have to you know, move again and try and dig another cistern. We feel that. We feel the reality of that and that produces in us this heaviness, this a depression. Are you struggling at this point in time? I want to invite you. Come to the river of life. Come to the river. Come drink from the river. Don't think that you can find solutions elsewhere come to the river God has the answers for life God knows you he made you he constructed you he knows your personality he knitted you together he knows how you work and how you how you shouldn't work and 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 what is a challenge for you and what is easy for you and and allow God to show you who you are so that you can live life in the overflow of his joy and then the last one there is abundance in the in the of life in the river. Ezekiel 47 verse 9. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be a large number of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Have you come to a place in your life where, where you sense death, where you sense the end of things, where it feels like like there's nothing left for you, there's the, like you've lost opportunities or you've made so many wrong choices that you think you, know, you deserve nothing anymore and, and you know, you're just sort of seeing things fizzle out. You've, you've got no hope. I want to say to you, there's life in the river. Come to the river. Come to the river. Come and, and drink the river of life because in its waters is life and that life will begin to restore in your own life the purposes of God for you, the plans of God, the promises of God. But you cannot have those things without God, who is the river of life. So come to the river. I want to pray as we finish today. I want to pray for us all that the Lord will help us. And I want to pray for these three things. I want to pray that this will be present in our lives and I pray for you. And then I'm going to end with a prayer of just praying for those that have not yet turned away from trying to make their own cisterns, trying to provide for themselves, and to have come back to the river of life. And so let's pray together. Father, I thank you today in Jesus' name. Thank you for your word that reminds us and shows us and reveals to us that you are the author of life and that our freedom is in you. That you have made us for freedom. You have made us to live lives of freedom. But that freedom is with you and in you. And so I pray today, Father, that your spirit will work within us. And there, Father, where we see the residue, where we see the result in our lives of our own rebellion and our sin and where, where, of the sin of this world and we feel the pain and the struggles of this world, we, we come today, Father, and, and that which is in our control, we want to come and say, Lord, forgive us for that in Jesus' name. We want to stop making our own cisterns. We want to stop trying to provide for ourselves and thinking that we know best. And we want to return to you, Lord, and say, you are the giver of life. So today, Lord, for everyone that needs healing, I pray in Jesus' name 
bring healing today, Father. Every person that has a disease or a sickness, we thank you for your touch upon people's bodies that have COVID-19. We speak healing to people right now in Jesus' name. If you need the healing touch of the Lord on your body, can I ask you, just put your hand in that part of your body where you need healing. Or if it's your whole body, just put your hands on yourself somewhere and just say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing to every person that needs it right now. Physical healing in Jesus' name. I also thank you, Lord, for healing in our relationships, for healing, Father, in our, in, our, in our innermost being, in our inner lives, Father, in our emotions. Bring healing to us, Lord. You are the healer in Jesus' name. And then, Lord, I, I want to pray for people that, that need your joy. I pray for people today that are feeling depression creeping into their lives, feeling a hopelessness, feeling anxiety, Father, fear, feeling the sense of dread, feeling alone and lonely, rejected, Father, because they believed the, the, that they would find in this life as they built their own cisterns, that they would find happiness, that in the next thing they would find happiness, that they believed that they would find provision. I pray today for them in Jesus' name that they will return to you and in the river of life. I thank you, Father, for the joy of the Lord that is our strength, that you fill them with joy. I thank you, Father, that you walk with us, that you journey with us, that you restore us to the plans that you had for us. I think particularly of people that may be struggling with their sexuality, Father, that may be wrestling with their, their, just who you made them and their bodies and feeling at home in their own bodies. I pray, Lord, that they, that they will not dig their own cisterns to try and find a solution for that, but they will come to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come to you that made them and know them and find from you the answers of life. I pray for that strength for those people in Jesus' name. And then, and then I pray, Father, that for those that live in scarcity and lack, Father, because they've built the cisterns, but the cisterns have cracked and they cannot provide for them. Lord, I pray that, that right now they will return to the place of life. Those that feel there's no hope, those that feel there's no options, that those that feel they've tried everything and it doesn't work or they've failed one too many times, I pray right now I speak life and hope to them and I call them back to the river and say there's life and abundance in the river for you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for that. And then, Lord, lastly, I pray for those that right now are being just experiencing your spirit speaking to them, saying, come to me. You've tried your life on your own. It's not working. Come to me. And I pray for them right now that they will return to you, Jesus, and that they will come into the river of life and that they will experience the forgiveness of sins and the restoration into your family. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to connect with somebody at the end of the service, please follow the instructions on the screen right now. They'll show you how you can connect with somebody to pray with you. Particularly if you felt today, I want to submit my life to Jesus and come into the river of life and live in that overflow. Then, then let them know. But anything else, we can pray for you. It's been great to be with you today. May the Lord bless you and we'll see you again soon and connect with you. Bye. We hope our Sunday services get you moving and ready for the week ahead. But why stop there? Get your midweek dose of encouragement through our weekly online devotionals from Pastor Louis on Tuesdays and our leadership team on Thursdays at 9 a.m. Subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages to catch the latest installments. Are you or someone you know facing a struggle right now and looking for hope? Perhaps the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and its restrictions have hit you hard. I'm one of the pastoral counsellors at Hatfield's Hope Centre. We offer emotional, mental and spiritual support to individuals, couples and families through counselling at no cost to you. Whether you need professional guidance or a listening ear, we're here for you. So contact our Hope Centre to book an online or face-to-face -face appointment by emailing hopecounselling at hatfield.co.za or visit our Facebook page at Hatfield Hope Centre. We look forward to seeing you through your healing and restorative journey. These journeys often include forgiveness. So don't miss our free webinar series on forgiveness that starts tomorrow. Visit our Facebook page for more details and the Zoom links. Hatfield members, join us as we reflect on God's faithfulness to our family in 2020 at our annual community celebration. It takes place on site Wednesday the 9th of June at 7.30 p.m. But please come at 7 p.m. for COVID screening. And we need at least 100 people to amend our constitution. So don't miss this chance to make your vote count. 
visit the events calendar on our website for more AGM related information, such as accessing our annual financial report and submitting discussion points for the meeting. Well, that's all from us. Bye! Bye.